Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Anthony Skelton, and I'm the Associate Director of the Robin Institute of Philosophy. I'm also Associate Professor of Philosophy uh, here at Western in the Department of Philosophy. So I am the moderator of this evening's panel, uh, which, as you all know, is devoted to the ethics of uh, gene editing. Uh, the research done at the Robin Institute of Philosophy aims in, part, uh, with aims in part to deal with challenging ethical and philosophical questions that arise in science and scientific innovation. Today, we will focus on one such innovation. Humans, as we know, have long sought to control the direction of evolution in plants and in animals and, of course, in humans. Recent scientific advances in gene editing techniques have put us one step closer to fully modifying the human genome in this generation and beyond. In 2012, the scientists Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier discovered that the gene editing tool known as CRISPR, which was originally a bacterial system, could be used to engineer the human genome. CRISPR, or clustered regularly interspaced palindromic repeats, is notable in part because it makes it possible for scientists to make precise cuts or edits in DNA in ways that are much more efficient and less costly than rival techniques. Gene editing techniques such as this have the potential to illuminate our understanding of human biology and also human reproduction, and more importantly, the potential to cure and or prevent genetic disorders. There are many user uses to which CRISPR can be put. and. Uh, it might be possible, for example, to use it to remove gene sequences associated with single gene disorders, such as Huntington's disease and cystic fibrosis. In addition, it might be possible to gain deeper insight into the genes integral to the developmental processes in early embryonic growth by editing the genes of in vitro embryos and then studying the effect. In her recent book, A Crack in Creation, Jennifer Doudna noted that with gene editing, quote, scientists have succeeded in bringing the primordial process of evolution fully under human control. Using, she continues, powerful biotechnological tools to tinker with DNA inside living cells, scientists can now manipulate and rationally modify the genetic code that defines every species on the planet, including our own. End quote. But what counts as rational modification? With gene editing, as with other technological innovations, we have to ask questions not only about what we can do, but what we should or what it is permissible for us to do. Which modifications, if any, are we permitted to make to the human genome in pursuit of scientific knowledge and improvements in human health and well being? Who will be responsible for regulating gene editing? Who has a stake in its regulation? Who is made vulnerable, if anyone, by its widespread use? Joining me this evening to discuss these and other questions is a panel of esteemed experts. Uh, so I'll go from my right first. Francois Bayliss is currently Professor and Canada Research Chair in Bioethics and Philosophy in the Faculty of Medicine at Dalhousie University. She has published numerous work in bioethics, inclu including and especially in the area of reproductive ethics and in health policy. She is the recipient of a vast number of awards and grants for her work. And perhaps most important of all, she's played an active role using her philosophical skills in shaping public policy uh, whoops, on a range of bioethical issues, including gene editing. And I must note, she is a member of the Order of Canada. She is displaying her fine pin here this evening. To her right is Julian Savalescu. Uh, Julian holds the Yuhiro Chair in Practical Ethics and is the Director of the Center for Practical Ethics at the University of Oxford. He also directs the Oxford Center for Neuroethics and the Institute for Science and Ethics. He's the editor of the Journal of Mental Ethics and has written more than 250 publications and is a recognized world leader in the field of practical ethics. David Edgel, to my left, is currently Associate Professor in the Department of Biochemistry in the Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry here at Western. He works in the areas of genome engineering and synthetic biology, and he has received numerous grants for his work. He has published many articles on CRISPR and related editing technologies. So my job here is to take responsibility for moderating the panel. 
So what I'm going to do to begin with is ask a general question uh, for each of our uh, panelists, and then we will see how we move from there. So uh, I'll ask David first. Uh, so David, what is gene editing and what makes it important for our society? That's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> Uh, what is gene editing? So gene editing refers to the ability to make specific mutations uh, that you desire or a scientist would desire in a specific gene in an organism that you're working on. And why is it important to society? Was that the second yeah. question? Well, that's, that's, I guess, the second part of the loaded question. Um, from a scientific perspective and from a biomedical perspective, this technology allows scientists to understand the molecular basis of human disease and other biological traits in various organisms. Um, and I think from an ethical perspective, I, I guess the question tonight is whether or not the technology should be used to modify the human germline. So do you think that then, just to continue on uh, sort of understanding the science behind it, it has uh, Im more importance if it's used in, say, humans than if it's used in agriculture or in other areas of uh, life? Okay. So by importance, do you mean economic in, benefit? Or do you mean or, yeah. <laughs> take it any way you want, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, well, I think, yeah, I mean, we're, we're all humans, so obviously we think we're the most important things on the planet. So uh, from, a, from that perspective, I think there's a huge excitement in the potential of gene editing to correct inherited genetic diseases, as you, as you mentioned. Uh, there are definitely other uses for gene editing technology, agriculture being one of them. Um, I'll, I'll raise the term genetically modified organisms, and perhaps we can talk about that later, but um, the agri-food business and creating the next generation of food to feed the planet is one of the uses of gene editing technology and synthetic biology. And I think you could argue that that is almost as important as, as human health, or actually is an integral part of human health in the future. Okay, thanks. Maybe I'll turn over to you, Francois. So um, what do you think is the important feature of, of maybe new forms of gene editing? What makes them distinct from previous uh, editing tools and techniques? Well, I think from an ethics perspective, uh, many people have had some understanding of what the future might bring. And so what people have had disagreement or misunderstanding or just lack of knowledge about is what would that technology actually look like? But for a long time, even including in science fiction literature, we've had this image that we would one day be able, in fact, to take over the evolutionary project. And some people have talked about that disparagingly as, well, that's humans thinking they're God and that's terrible. Other people have talked about this as, well, no, I mean, that's what we're supposed to do. That's co-creation. And we should, in fact, be excited about that possibility. And I think in that context, many people will you know, want to say, imagine all the good that we could do. Um, imagine what it would be like if we could make ourselves kinder. Um, not only kinder, smarter. Uh, not only smarter, stronger. And then on the flip side, you have other people who will raise the specter of, oh my gosh, but what if we made a lot more Hitlers? And that would be terrible, et cetera. And I think a lot of that is really missing what I think is the main point. So I'm actually not really genuinely interested in those extreme perspectives, though I think they're entertaining, and I'm happy to talk about them. Um, but I think for me, what's really important about this technology is it asks us ultimately to think about who we are, what kind of world we want to live in, and those are fundamentally questions, not about what it means to be human and what an enhanced human might look like, but really it's a question about humanity. And do we understand whatever it is that we think does or does not make us special? And maybe at the end of the day, we're just not so special. And maybe at the end of the day, what Darwin predicted will be true, which is that our time will come and pass and our species too will be gone from this planet. And I think what's interesting is some people find that quite threatening. And so I'm going to end my little introductory comment by saying I think what's really exciting for some people is the possibility that with this technology we would actually prove Darwin wrong. And we don't actually have to die off. And we are going to be able to take control of the evolutionary story. And whether that's to modify ourselves and get on Elon Musk's 
what's he called, the BFR, the big fucking rocket, <laughs> um, and, and get on that rocket and get ourselves to Mars, but think about all the changes we'd have to make in order to do that. So, I mean, part of what I'm trying to say by way of introductory remarks is it can mean everything or it could mean nothing. And the interesting thing is how do we want to engage with the technology and how we do that will say something about who we are. So now your turn. Yeah. So I just, I just will follow up. So you, you just talked about getting on the rocket. So yeah. is, is the idea then that you think that eventually or maybe what lies behind sort of, you know, the impulse to want to create techniques that could be used in modifying the human genome is that we want to make ourselves bigger, better, faster to, to overcome what, what Darwin thought were, you know, limitations to, I, I, or is it, because a lot of the sort of hype around this is about, you know, ameliorating disease and, you right. know, eliminating certain kinds of debilitating conditions, that's sort of different than, you know, making it taller, more intelligent, you know, faster kind of, Sure. You know, well, I think, you know, we species. have to be frank. The people who are the scientists, not just people, the real scientists who are doing this work, um, first of all, have to get grants. And so they are not telling the story about let's go to Mars, right? That's just not going to get you a lot of funding. At least yeah, not. I, I can tell you that right now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah there you go. Yeah. This um, just in. Yeah. There you go. There you go. But I think, you know, so where is part of the conversation right now? Part of the conversation right now is we will be able to cure things like Huntington's. Right. And then people ask them to be more specific, and it's like, well, we may not actually be able to cure it, but we, maybe we can just make sure that people aren't born with that disease by making certain kinds of genetic modifications to the human embryo. So a lot of the contemporary conversational narrative right now will be about what are some of the health benefits, mm. what are some of the therapeutic mm. benefits that we could do, and that's a really good and important conversation because that's manageable and you can foresee that. Hmm. And a lot of people are going to get behind that. I mean, who here is against trying to treat people with debilitating diseases? We might have a disagreement about what's a debilitating disease and whether or not it's worthy of manipulation, but there's not a lot of people who are going to stand up and say, hey, yeah, me, I'm totally against helping patients, hmm. right? Hmm. So right now, part of the conversation is there. But I think realistically, many people, whether they're for or against, mm -hmm. are, are already envisaging what would come after that. It's not just about that, because the technology is going to be the same. The question is, what's the intent? What are you going to use it for? So I think you can see a lot of people arguing this is going to be really good for therapeutic purposes, but then also saying, but we can also anticipate non-therapeutic purposes. And then the philosophers amongst us will start arguing and saying, well, there's actually no real line between therapeutic and non-therapeutic, so let's just be clear. We're really just talking about making better beings, hmm. and we can then have a discussion or debate about better. But I think the reason that I'm trying to take it in that direction is because I think that when we talk about it, for me, it really does come back to the question about what kind of world do we want to live in? What kinds of beings do we imagine being in that world? And in part, I'm also trying to hint at a certain amount of hubris in terms of what we think we can have control over. So for me, it's about expanding the range of questions that are out there for consideration so that we're not staying within the contemporary <coughs> discussion or discourse. Let me say one more thing. Please. Part of the argument right now has been about all these therapies that we're going to offer people, and I do think that's a great thing to do in the abstract. The other thing that people are arguing about or suggesting is that some of these genetic modifications are going to allow people who could not otherwise have genetically related children to have those children, and that's somehow very important. So that's another goal that gets advanced and then we will have people who will then advance a third kind of goal, which is it's not just about treating people, it's not just about responding to infertility, but it really is about making better human beings. And at that end of the spectrum, I mean, I remember as a graduate student reading very clearly uh, work, you know, that sort of said, you know what, humans are actually just too stupid to do certain things. Like what? Like not make wars. We're just too stupid not to do that. And so the comment was, just as you don't ask your dog to do algebra, you can't ask a human to not go to war. And so what you'd have to do is you'd have to change their brains. 
And all of those things can be interesting and or persuasive, but how you answer those questions in either, any of those domains about the therapies, about the treating infertility, about the enhancement, you are answering the question about what kind of world do you want to live in? What kind of world do you want to create? Um, and so that's what I want to kind of keep coming back to, at least in my comments. So Julian, what do you think are the more significant technologies in the gene editing uh, domain, and what do you think are sort of the uh, you know, important I issues arising uh, from them? Well, I agree with nearly everything that Francoise said, um, so <laughs> maybe but just to take a different spin on it. I, I think there are some areas which are really ethical no-brainers. Um, even though the laws in Canada ban these sorts of applications. So using gene editing to understand human development, the development of disease, developing tissue models of diseases like motor neurone disease, Parkinson's disease, I think this is just an extension of medicine. It will involve the destruction of early human embryos, but so does abortion and IVF. So I don't think that that raises insurmountable obstacles in this kind of society. Um, the correction of single gene disorders, again, this is just an ultimate form of medical therapy. In many diseases like cystic fibrosis or in many of the inherited conditions, there are missing enzymes. And now, after much research, we found the way to replace these proteins. And this is heralded as a great advance. But gene editing of single gene disorders would just correct this at the very most basic level and enable the body and every cell in the body to produce those enzymes or those proteins that were necessary to prevent the disease. So I think that stuff is going to come. Those are really relatively uninteresting questions. I think, as Francoise said, it's really the, the question of whether we, we go beyond the treatment of, of, um, of diseases to changing the human condition. And here I think I, I want to sort of just give a bit of a perspective Sometimes you'll hear we can't really fundamentally change our nature as human beings, or we shouldn't. And maybe David will correct me. Um, but I, I think that we can, and I think gene, ed gene editing is really just the last in a long progression of technologies that have aimed to achieve this. So gene editing is new in that it's more precise. It's like going into the Canadian National Library, if there is such a thing, where there are 20,000 volumes and picking out a single book and flipping through the book and finding a single letter in that book and changing that letter. It's different to older forms of genetic engineering, but really it's just a, a step in improvement in, in accuracy and precision, and that's why people are very excited about it. But genetic engineering's been around for more than 20 years, and if you look at non-human animals, genetic engineering has produced fluorescent rabbits and monkeys, it's produced mice, Methuselah mice, that live twice as long as normal mice. It's produced super mice that can run for five kilometres at 20 metres a minute instead of 200 metres. It's produced mice that are resistant to obesity, to cancer. It's produced mice with better memories. It's fundamentally changed non-human uh, non, non animals. And indeed, the, the best example of this is just dogs, the 300 different breeds of dogs are all very different. Some are stupid, some are smart, some are strong, some are weak, some are faithful, some are vicious. This is all the result of a long genetic experiment of selective breeding. So if non-human animals is anything to go by, the potential to change human beings is enormous. And I think this is something that we must embrace because for one thing, we will all age, and this is particularly pertinent to me. My mother's in a nursing home now with Alzheimer's disease, and I'm starting to find difficulty getting out of bed, having to go to the toilet at night, and all of the symptoms of, I don't want to age. And there's no biological reason why that's necessary. Um, we've already been able to retard ageing in non-human animals, and there are certain life forms which either age very slowly, like tortoises, or there is a jellyfish that's immortal. Um, I, I'm not sure if this is how you pronounce it, but it's something like Turopticus nutriculus. I don't know, David probably knows the... <laughs> anyway, if we, could, if we could emulate this um, genetic pattern of rejuvenation in humans, we could turn off ageing and at least double human lifespan. Francoise has mentioned enhancing human capabilities. 
improving intelligence, changing personality, removing psychopathy. People will tell you that this is impossible, but I just don't believe it. Maybe David has a different view, but most things have a genetic contribution. Intelligence, 50% of intelligence is genetic in origin. Chinese are spending hundreds of millions of dollars sequencing uh, genius children, trying to identify the large numbers of genes which are involved in contributing to intelligence. And I think this gives us an enormous opportunity because we're not all born equal. Some people are born with enormously privileged hands and some people are born with terrible short straws in life. Some live for a few months with terrible pain and suffering. Some live till they're 100 in relatively good health. And a large part of that is genetic. And if we can change that, in my view, we should make a decision about whether we stay with the natural lottery or whether we decide our future. Because on an evolutionary view, we weren't designed to be happy. We weren't designed to live much beyond 40. We were designed, if there was any design, to survive long enough to reproduce. But I want to go on for a few more decades and I want to retain my mind, I want to retain my physical capacities. And if modifying the genome could achieve that, uh, I think there's a moral obligation to pursue this. The moral obligation is very clear in the case of disease. I think it's absolutely outrageous that we're not investing more money in trying to cure diseases like cystic fibrosis and thalassemia and Huntington's disease through gene editing. But I also think that insofar as our genes shape the opportunities we have in life and how well our lives will go and what sort of world we'll live in, we should be also researching and trying to understand how we could improve that because normal really isn't good enough. And that's really the division at this point. Do you think that normal is good enough or do you think we can do better than normal? And we try to do better than normal with education, with diet, and with other interventions. And gene editing is just another way of addressing, as Francois said, the, the fundamental question of the human existence and what sort of beings we should be. And I don't think we should treat gene editing any, different to, any differently to how we treat education or diet or other interventions that, that try to shape how our lives go. So maybe I, I'll just- Before you say anything, oh, yeah. can I just skip, not hop in something, yeah. skip in, do something? Say a few words? Yeah. Um, I feel like I need to say something here just to be relevant. Uh, I'm just wondering, so, so we all just, want to say you should correct for, yeah. further, yeah. further to Julian. So David, when's the Fountain of Youth going to be discovered? Yeah, tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, all right. And, so, yeah. and I'll take your check right uh, now. Thank okay. you. <laughs> I, I just want to, I, I think I want to say something because I think one of the things I hope for in terms of the conversation is that people can get a, a, an interesting sort of sense of where there's agreement and difference and whatever. And so I want to say up front, I 100% agree with what Julian says when he says we're not all born equal. And that's both in terms of nature, so our genetics, and nurture the environments. I am very lucky to have had my egg and sperm meet in Canada, and I got to be born here. Um, and, and that's really important. Um, but the thing I want to say, I think it's really important for us to worry about, is I'm not convinced that gene editing or any new version of a gene therapy that we might uh, develop is actually going to address that problem. And so I have said, and I continue to believe, that one of the things we need to pay attention to with this new technology is I don't think it's actually going to level the playing field. I don't think it's going to help make us equal in terms of our genetics. In fact, what I worry about, which is where I, you know, I think you'll start to see some of the differences between Julian and I, is that I believe this technology will be used to inscribe your privilege in your DNA. Because the people who are going to be able to afford this are not you and me, okay? Or maybe you can, I don't know who's in the audience, but it's not gonna be me. And the reason I say that is we've had the first gene therapy rollout this year, and it's actually to do with blindness, and the cost is nearly 425,000 US per eye. Now, do I want whoever needs this gene therapy not to go blind? Of course I do. Now, this is in the United States, and we know that they don't even have a government-funded healthcare system, so their chances of getting this, unless you're really, really rich, or unless you can bankrupt yourself, or unless you've got a credit card that's got that kind of thing, it's not going to be available to the general public. 
That's that's my concern and or belief. Can I, so, uh, yeah, just no, let me finish. Yeah, so, so maybe what, one question you can ask is you know, maybe not whether you're going to find the fountain of youth or not, but but when when you're doing research on these uh, you know kinds of um, technologies and, and finding ways to perfect them and utilize them and apply them, are you thinking about these kinds of uh, implications? Or are you thinking, oh, this may be a, a great equalizer, or it may aggravate uh, existing <laughs> inequalities, or, uh, you know, are you thinking, uh, you know, m more like what both Francois and Julian said, that w what we're doing is we're not just trying to make people well or prevent them from, uh, you know, uh, suffering, but we're trying to, you know, find a, this is another means to finding a way to a, to a you know, a better future, whether it's in terms of the, whether we're better or whether society is better, or are, are your interests much more narrow than that? Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, so I, I what do you I, yeah. make of these comments I, I in guess terms I just, of the um, thoughts about the sure. promise of the technology or, hmm. or things of that nature? Yeah, so I, I think the public perception of gene editing now is, is incorrect. Um, it's very hard to do what we've been talking about. <clears throat> the technology is certainly advanced, and the technology today, which is called CRISPR, has built upon, I'd say, 30 or 40 years of previous research in genetic engineering and gene technology. And, and just to go back to the analogy of the non-existent Canadian National Library, um, I kind of view it as, as uh, CRISPR has like a GPS component to it. And you can program uh, CRISPR just like you can program your GPS. But unlike you know, Tom Tom or whatever, GPS, CRISPR is actually not that accurate. So you could say, take me to the Starbucks on the corner of Richmond and whatever, but it could take you to the Starbucks down on the south end. So the technology is not as accurate as is properly portrayed in the media. And I think that's a big problem for the future, and it's kind of, I would argue, the dirty little secret of genome editing is it's not that accurate. And so from my perspective as a scientist, and part of my research actually, is trying to make CRISPR more accurate, because I think what's going to limit a lot of applications, like Julian has mentioned, is the accuracy of the reagents or the, the biochemical tools involved. And the last thing that anyone would want to do is to make a mutation in the DNA of a person and have it cause a cancer when, in fact, you're trying to cure a cancer, for instance. So you're so talking about off-target. So, but I, yeah. think, I, I think this, I mean, if it, if it doesn't work, there's no really interesting ethical issues because yeah. if it, we're not going to be able to make these changes, then there aren't going to be dilemmas to discuss. So, sure. you know, I, I agree with you at, the, at this point in time, yeah. we're not going to be changing humanity. I guess the yeah. question that Francoise was asking is yeah. if this progresses, sure. should we place a limit at diseases, infertility, or can we embrace other more fundamental changes? Well, like, like just to get back to the disease issue. So even cystic fibrosis, which is considered a monogenic inherited disorder, which there's a defined mutation, 65% of the population have the same mutation that causes the disease. There's actually other genes in the human genome that modify that disorder. And that's true for a lot of different diseases. And um, for instance, another popular disease that, that is talked about in terms of gene editing is autism. Like, forget about it. I mean, there's Stephen Scher in Toronto has, has mapped or tried to map mutations that cause autism and found that there's hundreds of difference of genes involved. So I think actually it's the technology that's actually relevant to talk about because yeah, maybe in a thousand years or whatever, we might be able to do all that, but realistically, what are we gonna be able to do in the next five to 10 to 15 years. And I think then te discussions about what is relevant from a technical sh perspective are important. And maybe I'm just saying that because I'm the science guy on the panel here, but I think it, you know, it's um, important for the public to understand that this isn't an unlimited technology. There are barriers to what we can and cannot do right now. Well, I think, I think it's important to, to be grounded in reality. And I think that that's why when you have this kind of a panel, it's always important to have you know, somebody who knows the science a whole lot better than me, for example. Well, and, and I'm pretending I know the science. Okay, so. <laughs> good. Um, but I think one of the things, at least for me as a philosopher, that's really important is when I look at 
the science, whether it's this science or you know other areas in which I do science, uh, sorry, I do ethics work, um, it is important to have a horizon that's beyond the five, the 10, or even the 50 years, so beyond my lifespan, so Julian's not gonna make it, right? <laughs> like, I'm sorry, he is gonna get old and die, <laughs> and so am I. Um, but I think it is important to have that perspective, and I would say the reason it's important to have that perspective is there are decisions that we will make today that will be decisions that are forks in the road. And I think if you look at the history of humans on this planet anyhow, as much as we know it, we're not really good at taking a fork in the road and say, oops, made a mistake, let's turn around and go that way. What we do is we stay where we are on that road and we find another fork and we kind of keep going. And so one of the things that I think is important about the discussions is to be aware of when they're completely ridiculous science fiction and to be aware that maybe the timelines are gonna be much longer than we anticipate. But I think that you can see certain things on the horizon. So for example, we haven't cloned a human yet, but most of us anticipate that at some point in time, it's going to be doable, right? And we've you know, done it in a number of other species, et cetera. So I think it's in that context that it's always important to be sort of reined in and to say, look, that's yeah, completely but, but, but ridiculous. This is, but I mean, this is not a new argument. This has been going on for 30 or 40 years about cloning well, but you, humans. Well, but you can clone a human yeah. being today. You just have to split a human embryo yeah. and freeze one of those identical twins and implant it several years later, and you'll have, you'll have clones that are of different ages. So you can't do nuclear transfer at the moment in humans, but you can certainly. So that's another thing the public don't understand. But just getting back to your point about this, the sort of immaturity of the technology, I was at the World Economic Forum in Davos, must be, I don't know, 2005, and they asked me to talk on radical longevity. And I was giving the same sort of arguments as I was giving. This is pre-CRISPR, pre-gene editing. No, no, I, I disagree. No, no, wait, so I, I haven't made my point yet. Okay, okay, <laughs> so then okay. you can disagree. So then, and I gave the same arguments, and um, everyone's saying, oh, we won't be able to double human lifespan. And Francis Collins, who is the head of the National Institutes of Health and was in charge of the Human Genome Project, was in the audience. And I said to him, do you think we could double human lifespan? And he said, there are no biological obstacles to doubling human lifespan. The obstacles are social, ethical, and legal. So while you might think that this is just not going to be achieved for a 1,000 years, according to Francis Collins, you know, we already have the blocks in place in science to make radical changes to the human condition. Now, you're completely correct. We haven't seen the sort of speed that we're all, it's always predicted. But I don't think we can be confident as technology exponentially increases, the you know, sequencing power, the cost, every big data, all of that means that we're going to get a compression of advances. So I agree, we can't do this safely now. But it's not clear to me that in 20 years we wouldn't be able to do very significant change. And that's why China's investing so much money in it. Uh, because they see that this is a fundamental game changer because, and I'd like you to comment on, the impact it's had outside of human beings already, in yeah. agriculture, in plants. Sure. I mean, this is changing completely the way yeah. The sort of yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you know I I, I I kind of I don't want people to go away thinking oh my god they're going to be creating fluorescent human beings tomorrow with you know giant brains and so on, but I think it's also important not to say which is often what you get told, don't worry this is not going to happen we're just doing it for for health, rest assured that you know we've got the genie in the bottle, uh, I think that's also a mistake, uh, because sometimes it just quickly comes out. No, yeah, I, I, yes, I agree. I, I got asked by CBC News to comment on the fact that athletes at the Winter Olympics were using gene editing to enhance their performance, which I declined to comment on because I'm not going to talk about the ethics of testing athletes at Why the Olympics. Why not? Um, because I thought personally that it's more science fiction than science. And I, I honestly believe that a lot of what we're talking about is so far in the future and maybe in my opic view, I'm limited by my five-year grant cycle as a scientist. But, but, uh, but just to get back to Julian's point about um, non-human applications and agriculture, for instance, there, there have been gene editing in the past five or six years has really accelerated the pace of crop development and you know, GMO organisms or plants, if you will, or, or agriculture products. And there, of course, you know, the ethical implications of doing that are perhaps not as intense as talking about human germline editing, but 
you know, th th those technologies are already in the marketplace for a lot of different things that we eat every day. Um, are, have you ever had an Arctic apple? Arctic apple, have you ever had one? No. Yeah, the, the apples that don't turn brown when you cut them. Yeah. So that, that's a genetically modified crop. I mean, so, the technology is already in the marketplace. So maybe I'll just, I just want to re just return to something that y you said before, Francois. So I know in some of your um, published work, you've worried about you know, the impact on equality of the use of these technologies. And then Julian, you said um, you thought this might be a great equalizer. So, w so maybe we could have a comment from both of you on why. Yeah, I, yeah, I just wanted what, to sort of respond, yeah. because just to give you an example why this will, <laughs> I, I think that this will become commonplace. At the moment, that, so one of the great breakthroughs in Gaucher's disease, this is a, a, a genetic disease that, uh, where there's a, an absent enzyme that breaks down fat called glucocerebrosidase. So they, people with this disease don't produce this enzyme. And so fats accumulate in the liver, the spleen, the brain, causes severe brain damage. And um, one drug company was able to replace this enzyme so pr produce the sort of missing enzyme and, and essentially cure the disease. Problem is, it costs about a million Canadian dollars a year to replace that enzyme, and the enzyme has to be given for the rest of the individual's life. Gene editing, gene editing of an embryo essentially just requires a one-off intervention and IVF, so maybe 10,000 Canadian dollars once, not $1 million every year for the next 50 years. It's an incredibly efficient way of changing a disease. And so there's going to be enormous economic pressure. So when Francois says that it's not going to be available to everyone, it's up to us how it's made available. Of course, if there's a patent and it costs you $10 million to do one gene, ed gene edit, it's, it's not going to be cost effective. But there are reasons to believe that this it could be a massive breakthrough and also you know, if, if you can inscribe your privilege into your genes, you can also reduce the disadvantage that's pr present in your genes. So how it, its effect on equality will be determined by how it's made available. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, it could definitely increase inequality, but it could also reduce it. So let me engage with that in, uh, from a couple of different perspectives. So first of all, there's the hypothesis that you could make a once and for all change at the moment of conception when you're creating the embryo using in vitro fertilization, and that's going to cost 10000 instead of a million. Well, in Canada, we don't actually pay for IVF, so you still have to have the 10000 Well, you should pay and, It's very cost effective. Well, we're just going to get there. <laughs> um, so the first thing is you'd have to have the $10,000. And we also know that the success rate or the failure rate, depending on how you want to put the stats forward, is such that you're unlikely to be successful on the first cycle because in depending, again, on which clinic you go to, et cetera, you might be looking at a 20%, let's just, let's even be generous, a 30% chance that you would be successful. So you're looking at more than one cycle. So already you're looking at a financial barrier that's not unrealistic. You then also have to make a number of other assumptions. You have to make an assumption that the person knows that they're at risk for whatever the genetic condition is, and they may not until they've had a child or something like that. You have to make an assumption that they actually want to go through an IVF pregnancy, which many people might not for all kinds of reasons. So I'm just saying that once you start putting all of these kinds of constraints in place, it doesn't look so necessary that it's going to work in that way. If you take the example of Gaucher's disease, it was actually a huge debate in Canada about whether the government-funded healthcare system would in fact pick up that tab, and it became a very uh, hotly contested issue. And quite frankly, one of the realities that we have to deal with in this country, and I would say in any other country that has a government-funded healthcare system, is every time you get a new discovery of some kind that's really exciting and can help a population, do you make it available to the population through your government-funded healthcare system? And that is an issue that is going to only increase. So if we go back to the example I gave you about the gene therapy for blindness, you know, does our government, and it's provincial in each case, say, okay, yeah, we're going to pick up the tab for that. And no matter what you discover, we're going to pick up the tab for that. Canada, for the first time around vaccines, has done something different, which is that whenever can Canadian scientists, or any scientists, I should say, in the world have developed an effective vaccine, it has been made available to the population. The first time that has not happened is with shingles. 
okay, the vaccine for shingles. And so what has happened in this country now for the first time is Canadians are saying, well, it can't really be all that important that I get that vaccine because if it was really important, my government would have paid for it. They pay for all the other vaccines that are really important. So this can't be an important vaccine. Now that's something that in theory could benefit all people as they age. So our government right now has made a decision that it's not gonna pay for something that clearly would be of benefit to all Canadians, how do we know that they will make those kinds of funding decisions for all kinds of small esoteric groups? And so when I make the claim that I'm worried about inscribing privilege in DNA, I'm actually making a comment that's not disanalogous to the one that you're hearing now about the 1%. But the 1% now refers to an economic elite, and I'm imagining what would that world look like when that 1% refers to a, a genomic elite in some way, shape, or form. And yes, I grant you, we're talking many years down the road, but if you come back to my comment about today and tomorrow and next year, we are confronting forks in the road and we have to make decisions, the decision that this particular part of the conversation would make plain would be to say back to our government, if you're going to use my taxpayer dollars to fund this research because you think it's really important that we find an answer to this question, make a commitment right now that you're also going to pay to make that technology available to me as a Canadian because I've taken the risks as a taxpayer to fund this research. You better make sure I get some of the payback. I get the return on investment of that research, and we do not have that guarantee right now. So we have researchers that can apply for grants on any kind of interesting scientific question that they might have, and it could be in the area of uh, gene editing, and they can be successful, and they can make a small company of $5 million, and some other bigger company will come and buy them up, and eventually we will get a product that's available to Canadians, and I want to know, is it available to Canadians? Is that all you need to have, is citizenship or residency to be able to get access to that which you have invested in as a taxpayer? And that is not the current system we have. Our government might well say, we can't afford that. It's a great technology and we're really happy our scientists developed it. And maybe we even got a Nobel Prize for it along the way but we can't actually afford it for all Canadians. And so that, I think, is where I am in terms of sort of a, a general concern about what we invest our science in. Well, uh, just to take a slightly different kind of perspective, um, it's, it, the reality is that only about 20 or 30% of embryos naturally produced ever go on to produce a live birth. IVF doesn't, is, doesn't do that much worse at the moment than normal conception. Five to six percent of those births are genetically abnormal. Nature is not very good at producing human beings. Many of them are genetically abnormal. And so when you think about the future, the future is not going to be natural reproduction. The future is actually going to be IVF. Because not only will that figure of 20 or 30 percent improve with artificial reproduction, when you think about all of, all of you carried three to five recessive mutations, but then stack on to that all of the dispositions to disease that you have, common diseases like Alzheimer's disease, uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, Parkinson's disease. If you, at one point, can change hundreds or thousands of genes, and already scientists have changed 50 genes at one time in, in a pig, if you can change many, many genes, it's going to be enormously cost effective and beneficial to the individual to enter life with a significantly lower risk of diseases. Now, that, that is a lot further into the future than changing one single gene, but that's what's on offer, that you can, for the first time in human history, change the way in which we enter the world, and the way in which we enter the world is not particularly good. We all carry big dispositions to disease. And at least this is why I think that this is why I think there'll be enormous pressure to use this in a much more widespread way because IVF will turn out to be much more cost effective than medicine. Eugenics will be even more cost effective. Well eugenics is already here. When you have Down syndrome screening or when you have any of these tests for Huntington's disease, that's eugenics. Uh, it's just that. No, but I'm just saying, if you're going to make the argument on what's cost effective, what's cost effective is sterilize all the people that you don't want reproducing rather than pay for three or four IVF cycles for every person. I'm, I'm not advocating that. Please. 
Let's, <laughs> let's be really clear. I'm not advocating that. I'm just saying that you can't make the argument solely on the basis of economics because there are many and more so cost-effective ways. It's like, do you want to have more disposition to disease or less? It's this kind of simple question. But you want to just have less people. We're actually 7 billion people on this planet, right? I mean, and well, I've, that's another argument. <laughs> it's another argument. It's true. But I mean, one of the things that I actually find quite interesting when we do talk about reproduction is we tend to talk about it in isolation. We just talk about this person or this country or whatever, but we are 7 billion. People predict it's within I don't know how many years will be 9 billion. Then we have the problem of feeding the 9 billion, and yes, we might use gene editing technology to do that, but I think we need to think about the broader context within which we make all these smaller decisions along the way because, as we both said at the beginning, it's ultimately about the kind of world you want to create. Okay, Your so turn, Dave. Yeah, so, the, yeah. so, so the, I'm, I'm going to leave that one alone. Okay. <laughs> so, so maybe this is a good uh, time to think about sort of uh, you know regulatory issues. So 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 lots of jurisdictions um, are permitting, uh, in particular, the use of gene editing um, on human embryos. Um, uh, including the United Kingdom and obviously also China. Uh, here in Canada, we have a somewhat unique uh, policy where we basically forbid any editing on uh, the human uh, embryo uh, for any purpose, whether it's a basic research or therapeutic. Uh, maybe you could just sort of comment, each of you, on, on that policy, whether it, it constrains you as a scientist, uh, perhaps, David, or whether you, I know, Francois, you said before that you thought uh, that will soon be uh, no longer a reality with the pressures uh, that we face to, 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 to use these technologies. Maybe you could all comment on that and uh, sort of comment on what you think is a, is a, is a good or a reasonable policy to have on it, and, and maybe more importantly, say, kind of, who you think are the relevant stakeholders in this Okay, I just, uh, yeah, so I just want to make clear uh, in terms of the Canadian legislation that people understand. It is actually permitted to do research on human embryos in Canada. What is not permitted is to create an embryo expressly right. for yeah. research purposes. Yeah. So if you have uh, embryos remaining after fertility treatment and you no longer want those embryos for any number of reasons, you have the option of making those available for research. So you can do that. Um, and the reason I want to insist upon that is there are a number of ways in which Canada sometimes gets described as kind of an outlier, but in that regard it's not. So yeah. by comparison in the United States, NIH cannot fund any research on a human embryo. That all has to happen in the private sector. So I think one of the things that's interesting and controversial is whether or not in Canada you should be allowed to make a human embryo solely for the purpose of uh, research. Currently, that is not permitted, and a number of scientists are unhappy with that prohibition and are actively seeking to change that prohibition. And part of the reason for that is that they argue, uh, and they're not wrong, uh, they argue that there are many uh, aspects of uh, conception or fertilization that you're unable to study mm. if the only thing you can look at is an embryo once it's already been created. Part of the reality in a Canadian context was that um, at the time the legislation was drawn up, the values of Canadians, at least as identified through a relatively large public consultation process, was that if the embryo was going to be destroyed in any case, better that some good be able to come of it, therefore better that it be available for research purposes where there might be some knowledge gained rather than simply discarding the embryo. So that was the rationale for that kind of uh, policy position. Whether you agree with it or not, that was the reasoning. It was like these embryos were created for a reproductive project. We think it's really good that people should be able to access this technology, and if once they have finished uh, their plans in terms of family building for any number of reasons, there are embryos remaining in storage, what should happen with them? Canada, again, unlike other countries, does not have a limit, so they could in fact remain in storage in perpetuity. And one of the interesting facts in Canada is that that is in fact what happens more often than not. So the people who actually have these embryos uh, prefer at this point uh, to continue to pay the storage fees 
rather than to donate those embryos for research purposes or even to donate those embryos to another couple for reproduction. And that's actually a very interesting uh, phenomenon because now some people, including myself, are asking the question, are you just going to store these in perpetuity? And as I said, there's no legislation that puts any limit on storage. And a number of individuals and couples prefer not to have to make a moral decision. So it's much easier for them to just keep paying the storage fees. And then I wonder whether they've made provisions in their will to pass these on to their children and whether they imagine their children making decisions about these frozen embryos. So it's, it's a complicated scenario because of the way in which the legislation was written. And right now, as I said, there is a push on the part of a number of scientists and some people with a background in law and in bioethics saying that the law in Canada is inappropriate and we ought to be looking to make changes that would allow scientists to create embryos in the first place solely for research purposes. So my understanding was just that when it came to editing, you couldn't do that even on the surplus embryos. Right. right. So yeah. here's, here's Here's another feature. In the Canadian legislation, there's a prohibition on making any change to a human embryo that would result in a heritable modification. Now, what's interesting is the way in which the red legislation is written. It uses the word capable, mm. that the embryo would be capable, that the, the modification would be capable of being inherited. And many people have argued, well, embryos can't just jump into uteruses. So if you're doing this work in a lab, it's not, no matter what modification you make to the embryo, it's actually not capable of being inherited because it has to get into a uterus somehow in order to become a heritable modification. So what you're seeing right now is an interesting debate around the wording of the Canadian legislation to actually say, how do we interpret this statement, and would it in fact still be legal to do that work as long as there was no intent to transfer the embryo that you have done research on and to put it into a woman for the purpose of reproduction? And that work in theory, some people are arguing, depending on how you interpret the legislation, could be done under the current law provided you didn't intend to transfer it to a woman and to establish a pregnancy. Do you want to comment on the question about the policy? Uh, from the point of view of the scientist. From the point of view of the scientist. <laughs> um, well, I think that, that from, from my perspective, a lot of these experiments that go on in labs are incredibly labor intensive, time consuming, and expensive. And it's not, and there are very few labs in Canada and around the world that can actually do these type of experiments. Um, first of all, access to tissue or embryos is, is incredibly hard, it's, it's very regulated. And you know, and the success rate is, is quite low for, for doing these type of experiments. So, yet while, so while there is opportunity to do them, it's actually quite limited, I think, to very few labs around the world that can actually do this. Julian, do you want to comment on that? Well, I think that from, I think the important legal divide is between research that results in the destruction of embryos versus an intervention that's going to give a live-born child. So I, I think we need to make the laws around research consistent with other societal practices such as abortion and IVF. And for that reason, I don't think we should have any uh, specific laws preventing research using gene editing that doesn't result in a live birth. Um, when it comes to a live birth, I think the division comes between uh, attempting to uh, treat a medical condition versus changing a non-medical aspect of a future human being. And I think that's where the, the, the line has to be drawn. In the case of gene editing for therapeutic purposes, I think that's something that at the moment shouldn't be attempted but could be in the future. And the first case would be an embryo with an otherwise lethal condition. Uh, which would, would not be able to survive, and gene editing may well be attempted to try to cure that lethal condition. I think the, the really controversial case, as, as Francoise said at the beginning, is whether gene editing could ever be used to create live-born people whose characteristics have been enhanced beyond the normal range. And that, I think, is the, where the debate should be, and, and the other stuff is really an ethical distraction uh, and, and we're wasting too much time and resources on those issues. So wh where do you draw the line on what is a medical condition that needs correcting? Well, that again would need to be the debate. And I think that you know, it will start with initially 
you know, otherwise lethal conditions, then conditions which are severe and have their onset from the moment of birth. Um, and then the question will be, do you extend it beyond that? But, you know, a stepwise approach would be to start off with the most severe conditions and, and move from that. I mean, that's, what, that's how IVF legislation has evolved. Mm -hmm. Typically, it starts off saying you can use IVF and genetic selection for severe medical conditions that are present from birth, like cystic fibrosis, but not for adult onset conditions. And that's, oh, well, hang on, you could use it for BRCA and, yeah. you know, hereditary bowel cancer. And, yeah. and then so maybe we can do you know, genetic selection for those conditions as well. And it sort of extends. Yeah. And I can see the same thing happening within the medical realm using gene editing. Right. But I think that too much energy is spent treating gene editing as just a, a single entity. Mm. There are different kinds of gene editing, yes. and they raise completely different yeah. ethical issues. Well, let me let me challenge you on the idea that you know it's totally fine in a therapeutic context, and that what we really need to do is to move the de debate or the discussion around the more controversial aspects, which would have to do with enhancement. Um, and I think I want to pull it back and say, I'm not yet persuaded. Uh, that we should use the gene editing in a therapeutic context. And so here's the kind of reason I would be putting that forward. What you'd be looking at is a context where you're creating embryos using the in vitro fertilization process. So you're having egg and sperm outside of the body, you're putting them together, you're making an embryo. Right now, you would have as an option to do pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which basically <laughs> would be to remove one of the cells from that embryo, to look at the genetics, and to identify whether or not it is affected with whatever the condition of concern is. Hypothetically, for the sake of argument, let's assume that this couple or this woman using donor gametes or what have you has made 10 embryos. We'll just use that. That's a huge number. Hopefully, they haven't made 10 embryos, but just to keep the math simple. For the sake of argument, let's assume five of them are healthy and you've identified five of them that are not healthy. And I'll just use that generically. I want to say, why do you want to do anything with the five that are unhealthy? Just let's put those in the garbage or let's donate those to research or let's do any number of things about those. Why would you want to go and edit those and transfer them. So, you know, I would want to say, okay, let's take the five that are good and let's use those for reproductive purposes and let's discard the others. Now, the response has been twofold. Um, but after you use the five good ones, why don't you take the next five that weren't so good, have, you know, have them frozen, defrost them, and edit those? And I'm saying, no, let's just do a whole other IVF cycle. And part of the reason I'm saying that is, and I know this is going to sound a little bit controversial maybe, but I'm thinking like what kind of kind, caring, compassionate parent wants to take an embryo and take all of the risks of modifying that embryo and putting it into themselves or their partner to have a child when they could just choose an embryo that's been identified through pre-implantation genetic diagnosis as healthy. OK, I'll give you now, two reasons. No, wait a sec. I haven't finished. No. I'm going to at least anticipate one of your so reasons. So we do have to turn to questions shortly, but yes. OK, I just yeah. want to anticipate at least one of his reasons, because I know the, the argument is there yeah. are some couples who can't make those five good embryos out of the 10. So every single embryo they make mm. is going to be terrible. Mm. It's going to be unhealthy mm. in some way, shape, or form. Mm. And that is true. But honestly, the number of ca cases around the world yeah, okay. that's is a, a handful. Yeah, that's a good response. But, um, He's so, really excited. So, so no, no, no. But it, 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 that, that's exactly correct when you're talking about single gene disorders. Mm. If you want, if you've got a, so most disorders like schizophrenia have 30 genes or 50 genes involved. If you want to pick an embryo, that is, has the best set of alleles across even, say, 15 genes, you'd have to have over 10,000 embryos to be able to choose mm. the embryo, just for that one condition. So if you've got one condition with 15 genes, you need 10,000 embryos. So once you move beyond single gene disorders, you actually can't use genetic selection unless you use pluripotent stem cell-derived gametes to produce 100,000 embryos, and, and, and people are not going to be happy about it's that. It's the kind of world we want. <laughs> yeah. Like, are you well, imagining all these see. perfect people out there? But, you're, you're not going to be perfect. But we, gonna have less OK, so what are your five diseases, your genetic conditions that you have that aren't so perfect? I've got asthma. And, and again, so, so, no, so, so here, here's another reason why, and this is quite a bit. I'll finish with this, because this is a, a sort of technical point. But genetic selection does not benefit the embryo. Here's an example. I've got asthma, and I take inhaled steroids, which are very useful. Imagine that my parents had been able to test the embryos, and they found, oh, he's got a disposition to asthma. We'll correct that gene. 
They would have cured my asthma and I would have thanked them for it. Let's assume they used genetic selection and they had two embryos and they decided to go for the one without the asthma. Would that have benefited me? Wouldn't have benefited me at all. <laughs> Gene editing actually yeah. cures your disease. Yeah. Genetic selection just replaces embryos with healthier embryos. Now well, I think that's a good thing. cure your disease, you didn't exist. And the person that you've turned out well, to be without <laughs> asthma is not you with your life trajectory and all the things you've had to do to accommodate your asthma. I don't think asthma's asthma. had that much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so maybe what we'll do is we will uh, thank uh, our panelists and then we will have some uh, questions from the audience. <laughs> So yeah, if you have some questions, please make your way to the microphone. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, right. So we have a just a second. We have a big lineup. So just try to be brief if you can. Go. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Take your time. <laughs> um, excellent discussion. Thank you all for being here. Um, I really enjoyed it so far. Um, if we um, can, I think it's a relatively reasonable assumption that we're going to get there. So even if we are saying, hey, as Canada, we're worried. Uh, we're so worried, we're gonna regulate it and we don't wanna do it, we're done. China's not gonna listen, they're gonna do it. And when they come up with uh, the, the thing analogous to a vaccine that's like a cure-all, but it costs money and China offers it to us, why are we gonna buy it from them? So, I mean, if we, if we can assume, maybe, that the technology is gonna get there eventually. Shouldn't we take Julian's perspective and say, it's gonna get there, let's deal with it and not be so worried. Let's deal with it. So is the idea just that it's better if we do it than if the Chinese do it? <laughs> it actually, that is, that is one perspective to go, per definitely, definitely. Um, but but I think no matter who does it, we should assume that it's gonna happen when, and just saying don't do it isn't gonna be good enough. good enough. So let me say two things. I think first of all, you've actually made my point, which is if the Chinese develop it, are we gonna buy it? Yeah, somebody is gonna buy it. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And it's gonna be the 1% that's gonna be able to buy it, which is in fact the point that I was trying to make. But the reality of it is, is that right now, the way in which we've organized ourselves is in fact in terms of nation states and geographical boundaries, all of which are human made and are hypothetical in some sense. And we have developed this weird kind of idea about competition in science and things like that. So one of the things that I actually you know, keep floating is that one of the interesting things about CRISPR technology is it's actually an opportunity to step back and to think about the way in which we organize science, the way in which we fund science, the way in which we think about what are the priorities that get set for science. So there's lots of ways in which we currently do science now, and we can just have CRISPR come along and keep doing science the way we do, or we could actually start asking really important questions about the way in which we structured and organized science. And I actually think that my own view is that some of the competition which drives science today is deeply problematic, and I know that that's not a popular view. Many people will say that that's how you get progress, is through that kind of competition. But there are scientists, Kevin Esfeldt is one of them right now, who are really trying to buck that trend and to say, how do we know that we couldn't actually do better at knowledge production, for example, through cooperation? So yes, you're absolutely right. I have written a paper on the inevitability of genetic enhancement technologies, and the argument that I make there is if somebody can dream it up and succeed at doing it, Somebody's gonna come along and wanna buy it, and once one person has bought it, there's somebody else who wants to keep up with the Joneses is gonna buy it too, and we are off to the races. So I do believe that you're absolutely right, and I worry that that's gonna be the 1%, and it's not gonna include me, so I'm kinda worried about that too. So we'll go over here for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Careful. Good evening. Uh, I was wondering if, Generally speaking, uh, you guys feel like right now at this moment in time, uh, kind of looking in comparison to nuclear technology and nuclear proliferation, are we at, you know, like a 1941 scenario where there's still like a lot of basic science that requires significant investment that can be controlled? Or are we much more towards like the 60s where uh, the science has been kind of proven or developed and it's at a state where, you know, if it's only regulated at the national level, then anyone can hop border and continue research in a lab somewhere else. Um, 
Julian says. Well, I'll just say one thing. I think that that this is much worse than nuclear proliferation. I think this stuff about gene editing human beings is just a distraction from the real issue. I mean, if, yeah, as you were saying, it's very unlikely to be able to gene edit human beings very effectively anytime soon, and it's not going to cause the end of the world as we know it. What could quite conceivably cause the end of the world as we know it are biological weapons. And they're very easy to construct using uh, synthetic biology and, and gene editing technology. And you know you can make already in a backyard laboratory with widely available uh, reagents poliovirus, and it's only a small amount of time before you'll be able to make smallpox virus, which if you release smallpox at 12 cities around the world, you'd kill hundreds of millions of people. And that's actually the real issue. The real issue is, not the use of gene editing and genetic technology in human beings. It's, it's the power and the proliferation of knowledge around biology and its, its implications for creating disastrous agents. And I think we should be spending much more energy, instead of debating cloning and gene editing of human beings, talking about how we restrict and control the, the growth of the biological sciences and, and the dual use of, of that knowledge. So I, I think that's a bigger issue than, than nuclear war myself, um, because it's hard to make a nuclear bomb, uh, but it's very easy to make uh, a virus. And uh, I, th I think that's a vastly under, under attended to issue. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to comment that for biomedical uses, what's really getting in the way of, of a lot of therapeutic applications is actually the patent battle going on around, right now about the ownership of the CRISPR technology, which basically determines what company or, you know, more cynically, what university will own the rights to the CRISPR technology that will then enable biomedical uses such as gene therapy. And there's some arguments that the patent battle is actually hindered biomedical uses of CRISPR and other gene, gene editing technologies. Okay, so we'll go over here. With, with some embarrassment, I'm, I'm forced to, con to confess I don't remember the name of the problem with so many philosophers around. There's an ethics problem where an individual is forced to choose between flipping a switch to save an individual who's going to be hit by a train or leaving the switch and letting them be hit by the train. Individuals, individuals are more likely to not change the switch and let the person be hit by the train if it's not in their control to change it. But I think that still the consequences make us feel guilty. As human beings, we want to do something. So in the case of IVF that, Francois, you mentioned earlier, you've got several embryos. Let nature decide, or do we intervene? Do we not have a moral imperative? As human beings, you understand consequences, who need to decide choices. Do we let someone suffer, or do we intervene? I feel we need to intervene, but I want to know what your thoughts are. Well, so you're talking about the trolley problem, or some yes, version yes, of the yes. trolley problem. Um, and I can't answer that question, because I don't hold that view. Julian does, so he'll tell you why it's really important <laughs> to intervene. Um, but I just wanted to, to offer a different comment, just in the context of sort of broad and interesting conversation, um, and, and partly having an opportunity to say that philosophy is really useful and important, um, is that the trolley problem is actually being used a lot right now mm. in terms of discussions and debates about the driverless car, and how is it that we program the car to make exactly that decision? Do I keep driving this? this way where I know I'll hit one pedestrian, or do I turn the car this way and hit another car and take out four people? And one of the things that's been very interesting in those debates, people trying to figure out how do you program the car, um, is they've said, well, different humans would answer the trolley problem differently, so we can just let the car do whatever it wants to do. <laughs> um, but anyhow, that's just a, a little commentary on the trolley problem. I'm going to let Julian take that one in terms of... <laughs> well, I think there's a general point that you're raising, and, and I think this is fundamental to this whole debate is that moral responsibility is a function of two things. It's whether you can avoid an outcome and whether you can foresee the outcome. So there's all the difference in the world between, before, be, between when you couldn't do anything to prevent suffering and then choosing when you could intervene in nature to just let nature take its course. And many people think, oh, we'll just let nature take its course. We'll let nature select. But then you're morally responsible for what nature chooses. And you're, you're also blameworthy for, for the results of what nature chooses. So unfortunately, with power comes responsibility. And choosing to do nothing 
is, in my view, to be responsible for the consequences of doing nothing. So once you decide not to research into gene editing and not to find cures for diseases, you're responsible for the suffering that those people... And likewise, when you do have gene editing and you choose not to use it, you're going to be responsible. Now, when it comes to children, you can't refuse a blood transfusion for your child on the basis of your religious beliefs if you're a Jehovah's Witness. The law takes a view if the intervention is highly likely to be effective um, and prevent great harm to the child, you as a parent don't have the legal right to refuse that intervention. The same will happen, in my view, when gene editing becomes effective. You won't be able to refuse gene editing if it's safe and effective, because it will be like refusing to treat your child's cystic fibrosis. Yeah. I was just going to say, then the government needs to make sure it's going to pay for it, right? <laughs> yeah, that's why Canada should lead the way. Then you can pay for it. You'll have the payments. So, okay, just, just have one from, uh, I guess, right, Yes, actually, um, I would like to touch on the choices and choices of parents and choices of the mother. Um, my grandson had a brain tumor and my daughter was forced to bring the kid to chemotherapy and six weeks radiation. And I think the ultimate choice for embryo saving and uh, any intervention in the human body with genetics should be up to a person and not up to a researcher to regulate uh, modification of embryos and genes. Um, I am, uh, my school was in technology of chemical processes. I am not a scientist. And I would like to ask how is this research cooperating together between uh, generating, um, I would say, robots and generating food genetically modified to feed this robot. Because by nature, if the person is called by the accident or by the incident to leave this uh, uh, reality, they are called. And uh, I don't know how uh, human body, mind, and spirit is uh, uh, taken into consideration by your research and your interference with the, what the nature would choose for that person to survive or not. Thank you. Do you want me to take, well, yes. so, um, if I understand, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, to, sorry, I'm not sure I grasped all of the question, but I, I think I understood part of it, part of the objection, I think, which is a, which is a very important objection, is that people should choose for themselves about the modifications that, or what is done to them. So whether genes are used uh, or not. not. Not scientists or not other people, is that? No, my question is why are we modifying the humanity? Oh, and why? And why because, are we creating well, somebody live so, longer or twice well, as long okay. so the geneti genetically modified food is being sold? Yeah, well I, I can't talk about genetic, but I'll talk about genetically modified humans. Um, so that. We, we have this whole industry of medicine that is aimed to intervene in nature so that you know, people naturally get cancer and naturally get diseases and we develop, as you said, chemotherapeutic agents. Okay, well, I don't want to talk about genetic, but maybe you should talk yeah. about genetically modified foods. Well, I guess I'm not too sure I understand the question. I mean, genetically modified foods have been around for thousands of years. It's just that you know, the, the, the ways in which people have made genetically modified foods have changed. So selective breeding of animals or selective breeding of plants. Um, I, I guess, was that your question? I'm sorry. Uh, no, I'm just trying to get some logic into Julian saying that, you know, this disease is lacking this enzyme, when for me, as technology of chemical processing and trying to apply it to the human body, producing the brown mother, the genetically modified food might be missing the enzyme for the human body to oh, digest yeah. it properly. So for me, there is a big conflict between both genetical modifications of humans and of the food the human is provided on the market. Yeah, so I think things like for instance, the Arctic apple is a genetically modified food that you can go buy in Loblaws. 
And the modification there is to prevent the apple from browning when you cut it so that it actually stays longer on your shelf or longer in the market. And actually, you could argue that that's a, a cost reduction for the economy because you're, save, you're, you're uh, preventing waste. And so that doesn't prevent any, any transfer of nutrients from people to... Yeah, so, yeah sorry. Maybe okay. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Hi. Um, I would like to revisit the aspect of consent and the stakeholders that are involved and also the funding of the, this kind of research. Um, in relation to um, germline editing, for example, um, what do you guys think that the parents should say? Because their informed consent is very important, but it is, is it enough as a proxy for the consent of the developing child? And if so, um, I believe that raises again the issue of human identity and what we define as humans. Um, is it our DNA or is it something else? Um, and again, then we go on and we look at different views of human identity and is it a constant or is it something modifiable? Um, so yeah, I guess there's many parts to this question. Well, I'd like to take up two of them. So first of all, a number of people have raised concerns around the issue of consent and whether or not the offspring uh, has consented to be genetically modified. And the argument is that because they haven't consented to that, that that in and of itself raises huge ethical issues. I have to say, I per personally am not persuaded of the um, strength if you will, of that argument, because I think that's true of all reproduction. There's no child that sits there saying, I'd like to be born, could you guys have sex today? Um, and so I think, I mean, it is, I, I don't mean to be facetious, I think it's a bit more complicated than that, but I guess I'm not persuaded that that's, a, at the end of the day, a very robust argument. Uh, and so a lot of people make that argument, it's not an argument that, that I would make and or defend. With respect to the question of identity, I think it's really quite interesting because there's a literature there again, and a lot of people are making claims in, uh, under the banner of what would be referred to as numerical identity, which is that, you know, very simply the idea is egg and sperm meet and they've created this unique construct that will go on to become a human being and if a different egg and sperm met it would be a different human being and if you know you're having sex on monday versus tuesday it was a different being that was made and there's all kinds of ways in which people spend a lot of time writing up these very interesting articles about how you could have had this particular lottery with this egg and this sperm and then comes along the question of a genetic modification, and that was a little bit when I was sort of teasing Julian to say, but once you've made a modification, have you changed the numerical identity of that being? Because it's in fact now, if you've made it at the sperm, it was a different sperm than the one that. It was, you put five sperm in a dish with an egg, we didn't know which sperm would. And so, at the end of the day, there's a, a much ado that's made about that, but I actually think it's much ado about nothing, uh, insofar as at some level in this area of reproduction, for good or ill, we tend to treat the embryos as fungible. I'm not saying that they are, but that's the way in which the technology works. Somehow it doesn't matter which embryo. So if there were three embryos in the dish and we're only gonna do a single embryo transfer, somebody's making some decision, either on the basis of morphology or looking and consulting the stars or whatever it is they do, and they're gonna, they're, they're gonna transfer one embryo. But the thing that I do think is important about identity is work that I've done around the notion of relational identity, and those are the relationships that we create throughout a lifetime. They are not static, and the thing that I think becomes interesting is what is the origin story that a child has in terms of how they came into this world, what were the considerations that went into them, do they feel like they were a purchased entity, and I've written about that a little bit, do they think that they were created and modified to be the perfect being and because they don't fulfill their parents' expectations in terms of whatever great modifications they were given to become the musician, the scientist, whatever. And a lot of that's science fiction, but it is in that context that I'm in, I am interested in the question of identity and the ways in which we may in the language used in a lot of the uh, philosophical literature is this idea of an open future and the ways in which it gets constrained by decision making that's made by others and in this case the parents. So I think there, there are interesting issues about decisions that parents make, but I wouldn't anchor them in the question of consent per se. Sorry, I'll, I'll be quick. 
So I, I recently saw the, in the new, you know, the science news that there was a genome-wide association study which was published, and basically what those produce is a list of loci, you know, a list of, of polymorphisms that correlate with, in this case, it was a neurotypical brain versus a brain with, uh, I don't know if it was schizophrenia, but it was another sort of known mental illness. And um, what seems to be what seems to be the case is that we would have the ability to genetically engineer a neurotypical brain far more easily than we would have the ability to to engineer a an enhanced brain. You know, because statistical associations don't tell you what the genes actually do; they just give you a fingerprint of targets to modify. So the, I guess the question is, I guess uh, for Dr. Edgel would be sort of, uh, is, is, it, is it possible that, that that sort of would be the case? And also, what would be the ethics of sort of making modifications based on a statistical correlation when you don't know, given the complexity of the brain, what the specific modifications would do, but you would know as a group they would move you towards a statistical norm. Um, yeah, so GWAS studies, you should um, be cautious about how you interpret them. Um, it's an association study, and so the real question then becomes cause and effect. Yeah. And, um, you know, really I think is a as a scientist, you would like to see that that particular um, variant that was described in the GWAS study is actually causative for some type of disease or some abnormal condition or, or what have you, that you would then be confident that you could go and edit and, and change or, or modify in some way. Um, so not all GWAS studies are perfect, and, and so again, you have to take them with a grain of salt. And, and I think that's one of the big things about the human genome and about how complex the human genome is. I mean, we all are humans, but we all differ in a significant amount of our DNA in the human genome. And does that have an effect? I mean, some of it is good and some of it is bad. So I think the GWAS studies are a first step, but they're not the definitive uh, answer to what are mutations or changes in the DNA that cause disease or are associated with increased intelligence if you're talking about the brain, for instance. And if I can just add a, a little yeah. comment, only because I think it's a, perhaps an important or opportune moment to make the point. We've had a lot of the conversation thus far kind of complacent around a, a certain kind of understanding of genetic determinism, and we've sort of made a lot of assumptions that if we could just fix the genes, things would be corrected. And I just think especially when you give the example of manipulations that we might or might not make to the brain, I think it's really important to remember the nature-nurture debate, and I think in part in response to the previous uh, question, that was in part what I was trying to suggest when I talked about, you know, making assumptions that because you've made certain kinds of genetic changes, the being is going to come out and behave in particular kinds of ways, because after all, you have quote unquote made them to be smarter, stronger, et cetera. So I think that it's just an opportune moment for me to be able to remind all of us that we shouldn't leave here thinking that when we're talking about genetics that there's this sort of straight kind of line of determinism that whatever changes we make will make the life be uh, played out in a very narrow particular kind of way. So I think that in having these conversations it's important to be practical. And I think that although some future outcomes may be frustrating, we really need to think about what our options are. Um, and what I'm really referring to is, do we really think that by Canada banning it, it can really stop some of these inevitable outcomes in the future? Um, I think that we as human beings have a natural affinity to progressing further knowledge. And I don't think that we can possibly stop the human race from, from searching through, for, from searching for further knowledge. So the question really is, is do we stop it, can we stop it, and if we do stop it, doesn't that make it worse that only the people that can really afford to go to China or go to another country, that, then it will really be imprinting this in our, you know, imprinting our privilege in our DNA. W won't that make it worse? Yeah, so this is similar to the question that, that Francis, so I'll give you my take on this. I think that you've got a moral obligation to be an ethical leader, and I think there are lots of, so if it's going to be developed, 
you should be developing it in an ethical way. And so really cutting at the joints that matter. And so I don't think that all sorts of gene editing should be pursued. I don't think we should be gene editing people to be more aggressive or more violent and ferocious fighters or, or those kinds of applications. Nor do I think that we should be editing people to be subservient or particularly religious. Um, but so I think that what we can do, though, is to take a, a lead in getting rid of these you know, distinctions such as creating new embryos versus using spare embryos that really aren't doing any good ethical work, that, that they're really, they're, they're harking back to religious traditions or ill-informed public attitudes and trying to, to shape the progress of this science in an ethical way. And so I don't think we should just do anything because, that, because other countries are doing it. But I do think that there's a lot of China bashing that goes on. And at the moment, the Chinese are doing research into major diseases. They're using it to try to treat cancer and genetic disorders. They're using embryos that wouldn't otherwise develop. They're actually taking a lead. And I think we should look at our own values and be prepared to say maybe we should be improving our sort of leadership in this area. So I, I, I agree with you. I think we ought to be a part of it. But we ought to be an ethical part of it. Um, and we oughtn't accept everything. But if we're a part of it, then we can actually use the technology, hopefully, in the way that we think is fair and just. And, and, and I, I just want to say something to Francis. So Francis said we shouldn't, be, we, should, we shouldn't be genetic determinists. Likewise, we shouldn't be social determinists and just think that, that the social environment is everything that matters. And likewise, we shouldn't think that this necessarily has to be an inequality increasing intervention, that somehow we're determined to let capitalism forever reign every aspect of our lives. You know, we are free to choose how we make these things available. And I think that they're so profound that we ought to be a part of it. And we ought to make it available to every Canadian if it's important, or to everyone if it's important. And, and that's the challenge. Rather than sticking our head in the sand and say, oh, it's going to create inequality and the rich will just get it, so we're not going to have any part of it. Um, okay. Well, I'm not sticking my head in the well, sand. <laughs> I think, so we have to bring it to a, is that what you're saying? We have a few questions from the live stream. Oh, I know oh, we don't sorry, have time sorry. for all of them, but I wanted to at least get one through if I could. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so this is regarding patents. In America, only genes that have been edited can be patented. Can this be circumvented by slightly editing the gene in ways that do not affect the protein? Only genes that have been edited can be patented? Apparently, that's the law in America right now. Okay, yeah. I, I wasn't aware of that. But so, and what was the question? Sir? So the question was, if that's the case, that only edited genes can be patented, can people get around this by causing other small changes to a gene that doesn't affect the final protein product? <laughs> Would that be kind of a way to get around the well, law? Well, sure. Th this is a slippery slope, because you can change many of the individual pieces of DNA in a gene and still have the same function of the gene. So I guess I, I'm a little unaware, because I, I, I wasn't aware that only edited genes could be patented. So. OK. So if someone was commenting, this is sort of similar to like what Monsanto does when they have a, oh. an edit. But that Let's would not be talk a, about Monsanto. Yeah, here. that would be a, <laughs> So I just want to say before I close that uh, Julian is giving a lecture tomorrow afternoon at 5 o'clock on the science and ethics of human enhancement uh, on the campus at Western in the physics and astronomy building. If uh, you're free, you should come and join us. Um, and with that announcement, I'd like to uh, call on you to uh, thank our panelists and thank all the people who grasp great questions. Thank you.